Little Novels by Wilkie Collins, a series of five short stories dramatized by John Arden, with Ronald Pickup as Wilkie Collins. Number three, Mr. Marmaduke and the Minister. These silly, bookish people serve me up such a mouthful of gush. Oh, Mr. Wilkie Collins, how marvellous to have commenced your career beneath the prodigious wing of the great Charles Dickens. Well, true, Dickens was a bit of a literary mentor to me thirty-odd years ago. What nobody's told him is that I used to be his mentor, not quite so literary in Paris and even in London. I knew, and he didn't, all the intimate alcoves of those lurid establishments where we sought to disport ourselves incognito and lascivious, oh, like the Caliph of Baghdad in the Arabian Nights. Oh. <laughs> How we grease not only our greedy flesh but our swift imaginations with the scurrilous melodrama of a great city after midnight, not in pretense, but reality of life. <laughs> Yet is there a difference? Real life includes pretense, packs it up in a box, calls it pretentiously theatre. Dickens and I were in and out of that box all the time. We wrote plays, we acted plays, we shared our wine and beefsteak with William Charles Macready. And who remembers him in the age of Henry Irving? If he has been forgotten, it was his own fault. The best actor in the land, Macready, and he chose to despise his profession. I wish I could despise mine. I'm well enough off in my old age. I don't need to write stories. I could sit and sip my opium merely to relieve the atrocious pain in my limbs. I don't have to use it to stimulate pretense. But, of course, if I use it, the pretense must materialise, whether I want it or not. And if I don't use it, say... Oh, that villain of a chemist has failed to deliver me a package for the week. It should have come this morning, and I've had to send a servant girl, a fool and a sluggard. She takes such an age that between now and then... Between I... now and then, Mr Collins, huh? if that is your name, you'll oblige me by curbing your undignified self-pity. An affront to the creator. Who oh, the devil are you? I... Dear heaven, I'm hallucinating, and without the hallucinatory substance. A gaunt, gnarled, blue-nosed, black-suited Presbyterian Scotchman standing akimbo on my very hearthrug. I didn't let him in, so I must have pretended him. Pretended a name for him, too. The Reverend Noah McConaughey of Caldkirk beside Loch Rannoch. Ah, no, he's not on my hearth rug, but his own, in his own house. And what a house, so bleakly furnished, intimidating, damp. Look out of the window, the dreariest of landscapes, mist-clad mountains, the waters of a great lake, very near dark and pouring with rain. How on earth can this rebarbative Calvinist troll have emerged from my previous reflections? Macready and the rest. Uh, he draws the curtains and sits down. He's waiting for his tea. Tea not yet made, and it happened to be my birthday. A widower, 55 years old, with wonderfully little to look back on. It had pleased an all-wise providence to cast my lot as a young man in this remote Scottish parish on a stipend of 74 pounds per annum, and I'd never moved out of it. And yet, I was less decrepit than the kirk in which I ministered and the manse in which I lived. How to get the money to repair them in the midst of that sodden September... I could think of little else. What kind of a disappointed old grouch is this, for heaven's sake, for the cornerstone of a story? And all because I ran short of my beneficent drug. Damn it. Not that I ever complained. 
I possessed many blessings, thank the Lord. Chief of all, my good daughter, Felicia, named after her deceased mother, but inheriting her comely looks, it is thought, rather from myself. Now we get going, our cornerstone. Surely is this good daughter with her comely looks. I knew it could not be unrelieved gloom. Ah, and here she comes, bringing in tea for Papa. And she kisses him, and she wishes him yet again, for she wished it at breakfast. Many happy returns of the day, Father. Let him not try to pretend that his life is devoid of affection. My dear, it is truly gratifying for me to receive, as I do today, the warmth of your affection and your sense of what shall comfort me as head of our small family. Oh, would to heaven that my late unhappy parent had shown himself sensible of such generous emotions when he... In his measureless prodigality. Father, what exactly did Grandfather do? Everyone condemns, but no one explains. Well, maybe you are now of an age to be told. The tale is brief enough. He had money, and he spent it all. And I, his only son, got none of it. But your Grandfather abandoned his Edinburgh household for the vicious metropolitan circles of England and France where he frequented, in a manner I declined to contemplate in detail, such females as did not scruple to display themselves mendaciously upon glaring public platforms, indecent chickings, abominable stage plays, painted Jezebel's arm in arm with spouting robes. Oh, you mean he lived with actresses? Oh. What they call in the scriptures, harlotry, oh. whoredom. Dearie me, I had no notion it would have been as bad as that. Oh, dear goodness, I'd never have mentioned it, but... Oh! What can that be? Who can come knocking when already it's pitch dark in the glen? Prudence would warn us it may be a thief. Do not unbar the door. Whereas, uh, curiosity, uh, to say nothing of Christian duty, would argue that... argue that we ought to find out who it is. Follow me, Felicia. Who's there? A traveller. Lost in the mountains, please. Felicia, take courage. The good Samaritan himself could not be sure of the bona fides of the traveller whom he helped. There was a risk. He accepted it. So must we. Felicia, stand behind me. Hold the candle. Yes, I mother. shall open the door. Oh, oh. oh. oh the poor oh. man. He's collapsed with fatigue. Oh. We must bring him into the fire. Take my arm. I'll take the other arm. Oh, my. It's so wet. Thank you. Well, it's so dry. Oh. Here. Oh. Here you are, in the warm and the dry. <clears throat> Sit you down in the armchair. Oh. oh. Felicia, whiskey. Whiskey with cream in it. Oh, yes, Father. Quick, girl. Oh. Oh. There we are. Stimulant and mm. nourishment you'll observe in equal portions. Oh. Oh. Uh, now, sir, maybe oh. you will tell us who... Who? Oh, my name is uh, Falmer. Marmaduke Falmer. You're English. Yeah, I am. I declare, sir, you have saved my life. Oh, I... No, bide where you are. Don't even oh. try to stand up. Oh. oh, Mr. Falmer! He fell to the floor and lay there shuddering, aged about thirty, handsome, well-spoken, an indubitable gentleman. What could we do but open the spare room for him and put him to bed? And there he lies, quite incapable for two whole months, a wasting rheumatic fever which brings him almost to his death. But he's young, he's strong, and above all, he is devotedly nursed. Oh, he survives. Of course he does. And of course, he has fallen in love. When at length he was convalescent, left his bed, came downstairs. His gratitude to Felicia, indeed to myself, was deeply sincere. He seemed, however, unaware that gratitude has its limits. 
The very next day, upon entering the sitting room, I found him <gasps> alone with her. She fled in a very proper confusion. Father, please don't misunderstand. Mr. Falmer, what is this? She was positively kissing you. Quite correct, Mr. McConaughey. She was kissing me, and I had my arm quite tightly round oh. her. Which means, sir, that we would wish, as soon as is practical, to become man and wife. Of course, with your agreement, for which here and now I apply. What do you say? Say? But you don't know her. We don't know you. It's out of the question. Of course you'll want to ask me, am I able to offer her a position of comfort and respectability? I, of course, yes, I do want to know. Private income, Mr McConaughey. Eight hundred pounds a year. Eight hundred? Good heavens. Sterling per annum? Oh, good heavens. A golden avalanche. How to respond? As a man with a stipend of no more than 74, were I to say yes, would I not be enrolling myself as yet another worshipper of the infamous golden calf? And yet, if I said no, all I could think of to say to him was 800 sterling in one young man's pocket unearned. The moral justification for such a dispensation must needs be considered. Considered? No, you must... I fled from the house in an unseemly confusion, saying to him only... You must wait till tomorrow for my answer. I, I shall give you my answer tomorrow. In the end, and out of character, so it would seem with his uncompromising religion, he offers the lovers a compromise. As soon as he's fit to travel, Marmaduke must return to London and remain there for six full months. If, at the end of that time, he is still of the same mind, well, he can make his proposal once again. In the meantime, who was he? He had an income, but no profession. I seem to have heard that among the English it is perfectly respectable to be a well-funded gentleman of leisure, but, well... In the month of June, with no further delay, I found myself compelled to... I nay remedy for that day forth, the man's would be a desert. For nay remedy, they were betrothed, and I had to see them married. Had to bear a blithe face as I prayed for the Lord God to bring them safe through the snares of their honeymoon. Snares? Ah, yes. They'd let him know, but not until after the ceremony, as they actually climbed into the carriage, that their journey to our Protestant district of Switzerland was to be broken for several days in... In that sink of iniquity. Paris! Indeed, I raised my voice against it. Paris! Balls, playhouses, devil's diversions, popery. Why, Father, the picture galleries, the parks, the beauty of the architect. Rest the... assured, Mr McConaughey, we will shape our arrangements absolutely not to spend the Sabbath in that city. Goodbye, Father. Goodbye. Goodbye, sir. I do promise I'll take the utmost care. Felicia wrote often from Switzerland. She made it clear that the honeymoon was an utter delight. But then, once she and he were back again in London, oh, a complete change. Every letter she now wrote to me, no positive complaint, but always a tone of weariness, discontent, barely mentioning her husband. And in every letter, nay, all but every page of every letter. Dear father... I do wish you could take time from your Paris duties and come up to London to visit us. This for your lassie who'd not yet been married three months. My anxiety was too great to be endured. The cheapest fare to London being my steamboat from the Firth of Tay. Uh, how that ship did wallow. To fling a man's way more than other taps on teary. But every penny saved was a penny set aside for repair of the kirk and the manse. And by the same token, I could in London not only see my daughter, but also the absentee laird of Cold Kirk, a close-fisted belted earl whose purse, on behalf of the house of God upon his lands, might yet be opened by an appeal face to face. I took a cab from the London docks. Somewhere in the West End, there was this huge assembly, men and women both, 
across pavement and road alike, in front of a profusely illuminated building. I questioned the cabman. Why the disorder? Averbrook, says the cabman. Just that. Averbrook. Never a visit, in it? Averbrook. Oh, a name to be quoted beside MacReady or Irving or Garrick or Keane. The inimitable Averbrook. Only idol of the age for cavalier romance and tragical comical pathos. That so many should flock to see such an one. At peril of their salvation, so grieved and revolted me that even before I reached her, I had conceived the worst impressions of life for my child in London. And when I did reach her... Felicia, my dear... Oh, Father, I'm so glad. A fine new house in what they call Belgravia. But, ah, dear, how pale she was, how worn, how anxious. Nevertheless... Herself and my son-in-law had a succulent dinner prepared for me. I ate with enjoyment, except I did notice. My dear Marmaduke, you're eating nothing. And why are you sipping champagne when there's whiskey on the table? Now, don't you think in the early evening, sir, ardent spirits deplete the energy? They do what? Ah. Uh, where are you going? I haven't yet finished my dram. Well, you and Felicia will have so many things to talk about. I'll only be in the way. In the way? Of course you won't. I'll be back in two or three hours. Uh, no, but, but, but wait. Felicia, he has his hat on. He's leaving the house. Marmaduke! What on earth? I don't know. For the last ten days, he's gone out and left me alone the whole evening. Before that, he was out all morning and afternoon. <laughs> I am not going to cry about it. But there are two other matters. Neither of them explained, and he will not explain. First, there's a room upstairs. He calls it his study. The door is always locked, and the key is in his pocket. I will not degrade myself by begging him to let me see inside. But, oh. Father, at times when he's been inside, I have heard him from downstairs weeping and groaning, trampling up and down, laughing like a madman. Like a madman? But Felicia... No, wait. I have not finished. I said two matters. Here's the second. The woman in Hyde Park. No. Oh, oh no, Felicia. Oh, I can scarcely credit... He and I were walking there. She drove past us in an open carriage. Bold, horrid, yellow-haired... Oh kissing her hand to him, absolutely screeching at him. Mommy, my darling! In brilliant daylight! How are you? Not that I need to ask. Sunshine brings you out like a flower. The gas lamps can never compete. Oh, the deuce. Felicia, please believe me. The lady has known me for years. Free and easy London manners. Vulgar, I'll agree, but nothing intended beyond casual good fellowship. Now, I assure you... Why? I'm... She has assured you that you are her darling. So run, catch her, ride with her in her chariot. I shall walk home by myself. You have quarrelled. In the end, we made it up. But I keep my own opinion as to the character of that creature. Did he tell you her name? I would not presume to ask. I do hope someone will ask soon. Oh, please, can we change the subject? Talk about your affairs in Cold Kirk, please, till he comes home. I was thus in the midst of telling her of my intent to see the laird, when in breezes Master Marmaduke, at all but the unholy hour of midnight, pale and tired, but quite insolently cheerful, calling for deviled kidneys and more of his champagne, and not one word to either of us where in creation he might have been. So, you've uh, spent a most business-like evening going over the builder's estimates. Well, let me not dampen your hopes, but I can't believe you'll get much out of that skinflint laird of yours. Are you sure you've every item accurately annotated? Do you mind if I look at your list while I finish my bite of supper? Everything he said about repairing the kirk hmm. was so sensible and helpful, I could hardly interrupt him to question his conduct. You know, sir, my advice would be to um, edit this list a little. Order of priority. Essential items first. For example, your new pulpit. You don't need to pay for that before you've reslated the roof. 
He even went so far as to correct my list in his own hand and then to draft me a fair copy. And by then it was long past time for slumber, so nothing could said, nothing about his obnoxious habits. I told myself, tomorrow, after I had confronted the laird, tomorrow I would deal with Marmaduke. First one thing and then the next. Not procrastination. Logical progression. But what sense of progress if the first step is kicked away before you can set foot on it? Alas, the laird, having some notion of what I had come for, made a point of not receiving me, except with a message by means of his secretary who said... Who says just the sort of thing that secretaries say? His lordship, Mr. McConaughey, as I'm sure you understand, has uh, insupportably numerous demands upon his purse. Father, that was shameful. Why could not the man say no in one syllable? Ah, I abominate such fiddle-de-dee prevarication. Which, uh, I... Which brings to my mind, Marmaduke, a matter I'd wish to uh, discuss with you. Aye. But he's left it too late. The evening is wearing on. Mr. Falmer is already in search of coat and hat to go out until Felicia of a sudden takes strength from her father's weakness and... Marmaduke, please, do not go out tonight. My father and I would like to have your company. Company? Tonight? Like? Why, I I'm sorry, but I... But, do you say? Well, tonight is impossible, please. Take my word for it. Tomorrow, on the other hand... Tomorrow? Then that's settled. Tomorrow, you will take out my father and myself upon town. Town? But does not your father object to public amusement? Oh, no, Felicia. I don't think a public amusement... Today's would... newspaper announces a sacred oratorio at Exeter Hall. Ah, well, an oratorio... So long as I'm not required to enter a theatre. So there we are. That's settled. I could not see how anything was settled, even with the promise of a sacred oratorio. And the newspaper next morning upset me more than ever. So specious a paragraph about Haverbrook, the stage player, asserting that his frivolous imitations, for that's what he does, not to put a tooth in it, were impregnate with aesthetic spirituality, which is morally impossible, and all the worse for being printed in a respected London journal. And then suddenly, a servant called Marmaduke downstairs, and there in the front hall... Mama, you didn't tell me! Of course I didn't tell you. Felicia, he is quarrelling with violence. Who? What? Why, I do believe it's that yellow-haired creature from the park. What is she saying to him? Never you mind how I found out where you live. You know very well it is much my business as yours. And what have I done to deserve such a letter as that? What you sent me this morning? Now, just do what the letter tells you. Good God, you've done it before. It, it, it's not so unusual, surely. It is when it's a question of the Prince of Bloody Wales. Oh, and when I come here and find you're not in bed at all. No, Florida, shut up. you damn liar. How dare you pretend you're flat in your back with a fever? Now, Flora, is no, it money? It's not you know, I've Flora. never seen it for yes, money. Yes, now, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, just keep, keep it quiet. Shh. I can't hear a word that he's saying. Of course you can't, Father. Don't you understand? He's trying to conduct an intrigue. Oh, there I knew it. You're the same dear, honourable, kind-hearted fellow you always were. Give me a kiss and I'll leave you alone at once. Mm, oh, there you are, silly old mommy. What more do you need to make you see sense, eh? <laughs> Bye! This can't be ignored. Marmaduke, wait. Marmaduke, do not pick up your hat. Do not follow her out. I insist upon knowing who is that woman. No, I'm in no state to talk to you now, th this evening. Uh, no, later, tonight. Yes, I will. So, out he goes and he stays out. And he swore that he wouldn't. So there's no oratorio, and at midnight he comes home to put an end to the story. Now, were I drinking opium, the end could be tragic and grotesque. But I'm not, so it won't be. So, instead, do we call it happy? Assuredly not. How? When he admitted that he, Marmaduke Falmer, was in fact the man Haverbrook, notorious public mountebank 
who had married my child under the falsest of false pretenses. Disgraceful. But how can I not forgive? He lied because he loved me. As for his yellow-haired Flora, why, she was the manageress at the theatre, in a terrible state because he'd sent her this letter. He was too ill to work, he wrote, the very night that royalty was about to attend the play. I had not understood that even the stage players have the deepest sense of obligation to the theatre, to their colleagues, and thereby he was torn asunder. It was indeed his morality that compelled him to deceive me. A strange morality for by by the standards of Cold Kirk, but... By the standards of Cold Kirk, she would never have let herself love me had she known from the start I was an actor. I left the disclosure very nearly too late. The old man isn't going to forgive. Not yet, but here's the twist to it. What will he say when he hears from the building contractor? Aye, indeed. What? When I did hear that this play actor had personally ordered and partially paid in advance the restoration of my manse and kirk from his abundant immoral earnings, I cannot defend my acceptance thereof. And yet, as parish minister, I could not condone a rejection. The kirk must at least be re-roofed, or else the decent utterance there of God's word would be brought to an end. Alas, it is not impossible that at length I will feel able to thank him for corrupting me. At length? Mr Collins? But there's no at length for... Oh, in comes the housemaid with my long-delayed packet of drugs. The reality of which gets rid of all pretense. The pretense of a minister, the pretense of his scruples, the pretense of a pretense of his theatrical son-in-law. All of them vanished. <sighs> Thank God. In Mr. Marmaduke and the Minister by Wilkie Collins, dramatised by John Arden, Ronald Pickup was Wilkie Collins, Peter Kelly, the Reverend Noah McConaughey, Emma Fielding, Felicia, Christopher Wright, Marmaduke Haverbrook, and Carolyn Jones, the Theatre Manageress. The pianist was Colin Guthrie. The director was David Blount. tomorrow another short story from wilkie collins miss bertha and the yankee it's the tale of an englishman and an american who fight for the affections of a beautiful heiress <laughs>